Okay. Uh, so we have Dr. Matt Clement. Uh, it's going to present on his recent work. Um, I dropped the link to the seminar page in the chat. Uh, we'll have the speaker give the presentation and then we'll have some discussion time after. So think about your questions during the presentation. Um, uh, Matt has said that he's uh, welcoming people to interrupt him during the presentation. So if you have questions, feel free to raise your hand um, or interrupt. I'll also be monitoring the chat. Um, and then at the end uh, of the seminar, we'll have a slide about community news and uh, what's going on in our, in our community. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Matt Clement, who received his PhD from the University of Oklahoma in 2019. He was a Carnegie postdoctoral fellow at the Carnegie Institute for Science, Earth and Planets Laboratory from 2019 to 2022, and started a position at APL in 2022. His research primarily uses orbital dynamics in tandem with numerical simulations to study the formation and dynamical evolution of the solar system. Prior to graduate school, he spent five years on active duty in the Navy, where he was stationed on the nuclear-powered fast attack submarine USS Topeka as the ship's chemistry and radiological controls officer, and later as the assistant engineer. Uh, so well, without further ado, Dr. Matt Clement, take it away. Thanks so much, Mallory. Thanks so much for having me. And uh, yeah, this is going to be a dynamics heavy talk. So um, try to put as much uh, humor in this as possible to keep it keep it interesting. So yeah, the working title for this paper that's going to be the bulk of what I discuss here um, before we put it out was uh, the two to one uh, resonance strikes back. So yeah, hopefully, if you learn nothing in this talk, you'll get this joke by the end of the talk. Um, so quick outline, um, go through some background material, um, introduce uh, the what's known as the Nice model or the, the model for the outer solar system being uh, shaped by an orbital instability. Um, and then go through some few uh, updates since the Nice model first came out. Um, explain why it's been polluting your archive feed uh, for the last 20 years. Um, talk about some work we've done in trying to explain what's going on with Jupiter's eccentricity. And then I'm going to talk about um, the evolution of the regular and irregular satellites of, uh, in particular, Uranus and Neptune. Um, so yeah, like any good planet formation talk nowadays, we'll start this with a plot that has a bunch of exoplanets on it. This is a bunch of exoplanets. Uh, you're plotting orbital period against uh, mass. And this is Jupiter and Saturn plotted on top of a bunch of exoplanets. Um, so as you see, we're not particularly sensitive to things like Uranus and Neptune, and they would plot down in the bottom uh, right of this plot. But we can detect things that are uh, like Jupiter and Saturn. Um, and it turns out that when we try and debias all the things that we've detected, uh, things that are like Jupiter and Saturn, meaning um, they have large semi-major axes and low orbital eccentricities, and they're around a star that is kind of sun-like, is are, are fairly rare. Um, a lot of Jupiter-like things are on very short orbital periods, the so-called hot Jupiter. So really only about uh, 0.1 percent of systems are solar system like in this sense, in the sense of what we could detect um, of our own solar system. So um, if we break this down even further, the other Jupiter hosting systems, I kind of put them into four categories. And, and I'd like in this talk to kind of uh, draw parallels between our solar system and, and uh, two of them, the scattering systems and the resonant chains. Um, so if we look at the you know, the inner box that I had on that previous plot, the, the hot Jupiters, these are things um, on very short orbital periods, um, days, sometimes hours. Uh, they exist over a range of eccentricities. And dynamically, what's what's more important than the actual physical distance between a player of uh, orbiting bodies is the ratio of their orbital periods that really matters. These things also exist at a range of orbital period spacings. Um, then we have these scattering systems. This is kind of more the majority of the longer period um, Jupiter analogs that we detect. Um, these things have much longer orbital periods. They have much larger eccentricities, sometimes even approaching one. 
And then necessarily, they, if there are multiple planets in the system so they don't hit each other, they have to have uh, larger orbital period ratios. Uh, whereas the solar systems, there's more of this moderate case. Um, so yeah, moderate to long orbital periods, more moderate eccentricities, Jupiter and Saturn's eccentricities are like 0.05. So definitely not in that scattering regime. Um, and a more moderate you know, or, uh, orbital spacing um, than the more extreme case, which are these resonant change, which I'll elaborate on further in the next slide. Um, these are things with very small near zero eccentricities and very compact spacing between planets um, and the planets themselves inhabit um, these orbital resonance, resonances. Um, you might have heard of this most common type of orbital resonance, the mean motion resonance before, um, for example, Jupiter's uh, inner three large moons are in a uh, chain of orbital mean motion resonances. So the most simple mean motion resonance being uh, depicted here, Jupiter and Saturn in a three to two resonance. So every uh, three orbits of Jupiter and every two orbits of Saturn, they come to conjunction. So um, a very famous example of an exoplanet system in a chain of mean motion resonances is uh, HR 8799. I've been looking at this system for a long time now, uh, have fairly decent constraints on these planets' orbits. So the inner two planets, their orbital periods are around 50 and 100 years. So ratio of two to one, next one's 200, 400 years. So two to one, two to one, or you know, four to one between you know, two, two that are apart from each other. Um, so what's going on here? Where do these things come from and how do they relate back to the solar system? Um, well, we think this is kind of the entering state of giant planets after um, they form within a gas and the uh, gas disk disperses. So once the, the gas goes away and the new planetary system is revealed, we think these things should uh, more or less ubiquitously uh, form in these resonant chains. And the reason for this is um, as planets grow within a gas dish, once they get much larger than uh, the Earth, depending on uh, where they are in the disk and the properties of the disk, they uh, can migrate around in the disk, meaning their semi-major axes can move in or out as they interact with the gas. Um, literally, you can just think of that as they feel a, a headwind uh, from the gas as they, they orbit through it and they experience an uh, aerodynamic drag force and their orbits can decay. So if you have two planets, um, with orbits that are migrating within the gas disk. Uh, this plot here is from a seminal paper by Mass and Snellgrove in 2001. Uh, the, the light gray line is Saturn's orbit and the black line is Jupiter's orbit. You see they rapidly, their orbits rapidly migrate and they start passing these mean motion resonances, which are the um, dashed lines until they eventually fall into one, in this case, the three to two resonance, and then they um, migrate together. They can migrate inward or outward together, kind of hang where they are. Um, and again, this uh, process of resonant capture and you know, tandem migration um, is also evidenced by, for example, ALMA observations. This is a simulation attempting to match ALMA observations of the PDS-70 system, which is uh, maybe one of the best examples of what we think might be um, two Jupiterish mash planets forming in a gas disk. Um, and in this case, the observations are best fit by these planets inhabiting the two to one uh, resonance. So now the gas goes away. We have the solar system presumably in one of these compact resonant chains. It is not in a compact resonant chain now. There are no uh, mean motion resonances between any of the in this case, the giant planets. Um, so what happens? How do they get out of them? Well, the part of the answer lies in the fact that um, orbits can continue to move around and migrate um, even after the gas goes away. In the case of the outer planets, in particular Neptune, a big reason for this is uh, there's a bunch of other material out there that dynamically interacts with uh, the, the giant planet's orbits after, um, after the gas goes away. So we think that the primordial Kuiper belt was much more massive than the current Kuiper belt. So it was a big um, reservoir of mass to dynamically interact with the giant planets and um, integrated over you know, millions and millions of objects over millions and millions of years. You'll have these chance encounters where you can think about you know, some Kuiper belt object, the Pluto-like object as a, sort of a hot potato. 
Um, uh, eventually its perihelia will wander a little too close to Neptune. It can have a gravitational encounter with Neptune, depending on the dynamics of that, or of the uh, geometry of that encounter. Either uh, Neptune can send that guy on a one-way trip out of the solar system, and in the process of ejecting it to conserve angular momentum, Neptune can move inward a little, or its, nep its orbit can get closer to the sun, or the opposite can happen. Um, it can pass it down to a lower perihelia where, where Uranus is primarily governing its dynamics and Neptune can move out. Turns out just because of, you know, the Neptune, where it is, what its mass is, you throw a whole bunch of these things at Neptune, more likely than not, Neptune's going to pass things off to Uranus. It still ejects things, but more frequently it, it passes them on to Uranus. Uranus can do the same thing. It can scatter that hot potato out, move inward or pass it off to Saturn and move outward. Uranus, like Neptune, more likely to move out than in and pass things off to Saturn. Saturn, same deal. It's more likely to hand things off to Jupiter. Jupiter is the big vacuum cleaner of the solar system. It's most likely to send these things on a one-way trip out of the solar system. So um, integrated, again, over millions of these encounters and millions of years, this is the net effect. The net effect of the Kuiper belt interacting with the giant planets in their resonant chain is it's pulling that resonant chain apart. Um, so this, you know, this idea of uh, planetesimal driven migration dates back 30 or more years. Um, this is a plot from a 1995 paper by Renu Mahaltra uh, predicting what the resonant population of the Kuiper belt would look like due to this process, due to the process of Neptune's outward migration. Um, this is pretty amazing because this plot was made when we did not know of very many Kuiper belt objects. And at least for the inner Kuiper belt here, I'm plotting um, the, the known Kuiper belt now, uh, squished out to try and uh, match the shape of this as, as best as possible. Um, and this process does a very good job and there's there's reasons um, that that you know 40 to 50 AU region doesn't match up as well, but this process does a very good job of explaining resonant capture in the Kuiper belt. So what's the um, what's the end uh, end state of this process of planetesimal driven migration now where you don't have the gas around to to mediate? Um, well, the, the end state is uh, you'll eventually pull the giant planets into an unstable configuration and their orbits destabilize and that brings them to um, their current orbits. So you might have seen this video before, what you're looking at here. The circles are the orbits of the giant planets and the green points are Kuiper Belt objects. So time goes on. Giant planets orbits are migrating. Eventually, you get tugged out of these resonances. You hit some unstable configuration, and the whole system goes boom. This disperses the primordial Kuiper belt. Um, it brings the giant planets to their current orbits. Again, you've probably heard of this referred to um, as the Nice model. That's where a bunch of folks came up with it um, in the early 2000s. And as I mentioned earlier, um, that, that term Nice model or giant planet instability might have been uh, polluting your archive feed uh, for the last 20 years. So I'm going to try and uh, break down some of the important um, things about the Nice model and why we, uh, why we should care about it when we try and understand the uh, formation of the ice giants and their satellite systems. Um, so first of all, you know, this is just the ultimate con. Uh, consequence of this uh, migration process in the outer solar system. This is, again, why so many of those Jupiter analogs are not in those resonant chains. The, you know, these, these things inevitably uh, destabilize. Um, and this is why, again, the, the solar system is not in a resonant chain now. We've detected so few of these resonant chains of giant planets around other stars and many, many of these uh, other distant long period giant planets that we detect have very large eccentricities because they experience very violent instabilities. Um, so it explains, as I said, the orbital spacing and the eccentricities of the giant planets, namely that they're non-zero. Um, it's been used to explain the capture of Trojans at each giant planet, irregular satellite capture, um, many qualities of the asteroid belt and the Kuiper belt. Um, qualities of Mercury's orbit. Mercury is the uh, most eccentric and most inclined planet. 
um, even things uh, like cratering records on the Galilean satellites and um, properties of the regular moons of the outer solar system planets. Um, so yeah, like I said, a lot of a lot of work has been done on the Nice model. I'm going to tell you about more of it. Um, but a lot of these things are are maybe consistencies, maybe not necessarily um, you know evidence for the solar system having had to experience. Um, and instability, but I wanted to highlight these these three aspects as kind of our you know our best evidence for this being um, sort of the current consensus model for the dynamical evolution of the outer solar system. Um, these are things that we don't really have um, another you know good explanation for. Um, that would be the capture of the trojans of each um, of the co-orbitals of each giant planet. So what you're seeing here is a plot of um, the known Trojans of Jupiter, which are the uh, small little points, and then simulation generated uh, Trojans, Nice model instability simulation being run with a whole bunch of objects. And you get these, these captures that can match some of the orbital properties uh, very well. Kind of same thing with the irregular moons. Um, this, this process of regular satellite captures is very, very rare. The capture efficiencies for any given Kuiper belt object are something like 10 to the minus eight, 10, 10 to the minus nine. But you know, if you study this thing statistically and, and you run with enough particles, you can get, again, um, here, the simulation, gen simulation generated uh, irregular satellites are, are the points in these plots and the green triangle or the red triangles are the actual known uh, Trojan. So you can match this very well. And then um, something else that this, this kind of explains that I'm going to elaborate on um, in the next couple slides is just the fact that we have an asteroid belt that looks the way that it does with all the fine structure that the asteroid belt does. Again, um, if you believe that the giant planets had to have formed in a more compact configuration than they did, than they are in now, they had to get there one way or another. So the one way or another is via the instability or just they smoothly migrated the whole way. Um, and if you smoothly migrate in particular Jupiter and Saturn from any of their possible formation locations all the way out to where they are now, you drag a bunch of resonances across the asteroid belt and you totally wipe out the orbital structure of the asteroid belt. Um, so that can kind of concludes the outline section of the talk. Now I want to talk about uh, in particular two kind of major updates to the Nice model itself um, since its initial initially was proposed in the early 2000s. Um, the first one goes off that kind of problem with the asteroid belt that you know, if you smoothly migrate the giant planets for too long, or in particular for too bad of a range of orbital period ratios between Jupiter and Saturn, um, you, you totally wipe out the asteroid belt and mess up its orbital structure. Um, so the, the way around this is now not just an instability, but a specific type of instability evolution, it's sometimes referred to as the jumping Jupiter model, but really um, what you need to not mess up the asteroid belt is you need an instability where Jupiter and Saturn's orbits, their orbital period ratios in particular, what's being plotted here, orbital period ratio against time, you need them to diverge in a stepwise manner, right? So you jump those harmful resonances all the way across the belt and you don't wipe it up. The way to get this jump is with an encounter uh, with another planetary mass object. So this is where you might have seen starting to be invoked additional additional uh, primordial ice giants in the uh, outer solar system. What's important is to get this jump, the encounter has to be between Jupiter and Saturn and an ice giant, a smaller object. Jupiter and Saturn cannot encounter each other, which is what happens in this simulation here. If you know the ge geometry is such that you, know, you have a close gravitational exchange between Jupiter and Saturn, inevitably you end up in this scattering regime. You you wipe out all the other stuff in the solar system, and you end up with Jupiter and Saturn with very very large orbital eccentricities, which is presumably a formation route for those scattering um, systems that I I talked about earlier that we observe around other stars. Um, so another problem that kind of required an evolution is uh, a resolution is what happens to the terrestrial planets. So initially it was proposed and you might've heard before that the Nice model would have occurred coincident with the late heavy bombardment. So something like 700 million years after the planets formed, this is 
after the terrestrial planets formed, they would have been fully formed at the time. So if you run the simulation with the terrestrial planets in there fully formed, now we've zoomed in in this video on the orbits of Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, you see inevitably Mercury, or in some cases Mars too, will get um, ejected. So if this instability happens, even, you know, this is a, this video here is from, um, from a simulation where, uh, you know, every, we matched all the different, you know, important parameters of the outer solar system, but you still destabilize the orbits in the, in the inner solar system. Um, so the terrestrial planets, how they survived, um, and particularly Mercury and Mars was another kind of problem to, to overcome from the initial Nice model as, as it was originally proposed. And uh, resolution to this that, you know, myself and some other collaborators have worked on a lot over the last um, five, 10 years. Um, obviously, if the terrestrial planets were not fully formed when the instability happened, um, you could potentially get around this problem. And there are several other um, uh, lines of, uh, or arguments uh, pointing towards the Nice model not necessarily having to coincide uh, with the late heavy bombardment. Um, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go into these in too much detail, but we're kind of at a point now where we are, uh, there's a kind of consensus building around the instability having transpired um, within the first hundred million years or even more uh, even sooner after the formation of the solar system um, to kind of, you know, go full circle on that whole thread about the uh, terrestrial planets, um, kind of to resolve two, two problems, what, what we worked on, you know, the, the one problem being the Nice model destabilizing the fully formed terrestrial planets, and the other problem being that uh, classic terrestrial planet formation models uh, tend to produce overly massive Mars analogs and planets in the asteroid belt. Um, if you have the instability kick off within the first few, uh, few million years after the terrestrial planets uh, start forming, you can kind of resolve both these problems at once. You can, through the, you know, the perturbations of the giant planets excited orbits on the asteroid belt, um, you can deplete re uh, material in the Mars region um, and you can still, you know, form the other four planets without losing them in a late instability. So kind of the, the big takeaways from this initial part of the talk, you know, instability probably happened with more ice giants than we have now and probably happened um, very, very soon after the solar system formed, either within the first hundred million years or, or much, much sooner, like within the first few million years. So um, next thing I want to talk about is, is work that we've done um, on Jupiter's eccentricity. And I will uh, try, and, um, try, and, try and help you understand what, what I'm getting at with that. Um, so I alluded to several times earlier in the talk, you know, well, this is a good instability. This is the right instability, right? Um, this, this matches a lot of important things. Um, so what do, we, what do we mean by that? How do we get at what the right, you know, type of instability, the right initial conditions in the outer solar system for the instability might have been? Um, it's kind of a two-part process. So, you know, in the, the pre-instability time frame, we got to kind of use, you know, simulations of the giant planets evolving um, in the primordial gas disk to figure out what the most likely initial orbits that they might have inhabited are. And then, you know, the instability is highly stochastic. So you really have to just run, you know, hundreds and thousands of simulations of these different uh, possible configurations to get at what the best ones might be. Um, so, you know, early studies in the early 2000s um, of the first variety indicated rather convincingly that the most uh, likely initial configuration for a Jupiter and Saturn-like mass configuration um, is capture in the three to two resonance. And then these sort of statistical studies um, kind of favored, again, like I said, this jumping Jupiter style instability um, with five or six total planets. So an additional one or two primordial ice giants in chains of, you know, three to two, two to one uh, resonances. So I'm going to show a bunch of plots like this coming up, the top panel, you're looking at um, the orbital perihelia and aphelia for each of the planets and the bottom 
uh, panels plotting the Jupiter-Saturn period ratio. So that gray region is kind of the no-go zone where you mess things up in the inner solar system. So you want to jump across that region um, in orbital period space, orbital period ratio space. Um, so again, you know, I'm going to be arguing that you know so these instabilities are better than those instabilities because they do a you know a few percent better job of matching all these things. But it is important to remember that you know even if a particular evolution is only successful in you know a fraction of simulations, it could represent a viable you know path for the solar system. So we have to pull a thread on all this stuff. Uh, but it's still important to identify these you know good formation routes because we want to study all this other stuff, right? We want to, I don't want to waste a whole bunch of CPU time. We want to figure out, want to find instabilities that work and can match all these things so we can uh, study all this, this other stuff about the solar system. Um, so what are the main constraints that we use when trying to um, constrain the instability? Obviously you want four planets on the back end. You want Jupiter and Saturn's orbital period ratio to to be close to what it is today. Right now it's 2.49. So in particular, I don't wanna go past that 2.5, which is the five to two resonance. Um, you wanna match Jupiter and Saturn's eccentricities and same with Uranus and Neptune. Turns out that Uranus and Neptune, the matching their orbits and the evolution of their orbits is very important for understanding um, primordial properties of the Kuiper belt. And this is kind of a balancing act, even when you look at this statistically. Um, so, you know, if like, for example, if you're systematically getting too weak of encounters with the injected ice giant, um, you can obviously underexcite Jupiter and Saturn's eccentricities. If you're systematically getting too strong of encounters, um, you can have the jump be too far. So in this case, you see uh, in the bottom panel, Jupiter and Saturn jump well past um, the five to two, well past 2.5. Um, the initial mass that you place in the Kuiper belt matters a lot too. So if you don't have enough mass left over after the instability, you kind of have insufficient, you know, driving power to push the giant planets to their, or the ice giants to their modern semi-major axes. So in this case, they kind of stop short of where they need to go. Um, but also if you have too much, uh, you, you might need it for pushing the ice giants where they need to go, but it also might mess things up with Jupiter and Saturn. So you could have them finish the instability, you know, less than with the pe orbital period ratio, less than 2.5, then through that residual migration phase, interacting with that leftover mass in the Kuiper belt, they get pushed beyond it. Um, so what I wanted to elaborate kind of in, on in this last part of the talk is um, what we've done, the work we've done trying to match Jupiter and Saturn's eccentricities. And, and this is more than just, you know, their eccentricity is 0.05. It's more than just matching the time average eccentricity of Jupiter and Saturn. I'm gonna try and explain that um, here. So. For those who you know do not think about orbits all day, um, this is the orbit that, that you all learned back in, in school. Um, so that the shapes defined by the semi-major axis and the eccentricity, um, but there's all these other angles that we need to define an orbit. And in particular, um, for what we're gonna think about next, what's, what's important um, is the longitude of perihelia. So where the, uh, the you know, in a, fixed reference frame where the angle where the planet's coming to perihelia and uh, the longitude of ascending node where the uh, um, planet goes from above the plane to below the plane. So that's a perfect um, two-body problem, you know, Keplerian orbit, but the solar system is not a perfect two-body problem. Um, so, you know, orbits are not uh, perfectly uh, Keplerian in that sense. We have to think about the perturbations from all the other planets. Um, so this is often referred to as the secular problem. Um, this has been hacked at since the 1800s. Um, this is kind of the common way of going about this, uh, breaking the Hamiltonian into the Keplerian part, and then the uh, expanding and in um, terms of uh, the power of the masses of the planets. And if you, you get, get at that first perturbation, um, the solution to it is this so-called Lagrange Laplace solution. Um, so this is, it describes the evolution of each planet's eccentricity and inclination, and also the longitudes of perihelia and the longitudes of their ascending nodes. Um, so you see each, each planet here, the eye for each planet, um, the, evolution of those E's and I's and omegas is a, a sum of terms from each other planet. So you see you have in, in these different sum of eight 
terms from each planet. You have these uh, frequencies, G's and S's. You have these uh, magnitudes. Um, so that's a magnitude, like a magnitude in terms of eccentricity. Um, and that, that will describe the uh, precession of each planet's orbit. So that's being shown in that video down there. Um, the point of this talk is not to derive these things. You just need a high accuracy numerical simulation. People have done this for a long time. You can generate these big tables of what all these, these values are. Um, but you know the, the solar system is, can be simplified into just the Jupiter-Saturn sun system. Um, in that case, you know, you have a sufficient number of variables and unknowns to get a more exact solution to this. So for just the Jupiter-Saturn system, which does a pretty good job of approximating what the, you know, evolution of the solar system is, um, you can break down the eccentricity evolution of both planets as, as such. Um, as you see, I have a simulation um, output of Jupiter and Saturn's eccentricity evolution over time. And you see, you know, they kind of oscillate between when this cosine term here is, is plus and minus one. And, you know, there's some higher order perturbations in there, mostly from Uranus. It does a pretty good job of, of explaining things. So it's those, you know, four magnitudes, the Jupiter and Saturn's uh, natural eccentricity and their uh, mutual forcing terms on one another, E55, so that's uh, Jupiter's natural eccentricity, 0.04 in the solar system, Saturn's forcing on Jupiter, E56, and then um, the same for Saturn, it's natural in the cross term. So hopefully everyone is sufficiently confused now, so I thought I'd bring in an analogy here to kind of get at why, um, why there's a problem here that we've been working on resolving. So if instead of thinking about um, the, the effect of each planet on one another in the solar system. Um, you don't have to be a basketball fan to understand this. You really just have to understand that um, in the Bulls, uh, Michael Jordan was the best, right? And Scottie Pippen was, was the second best. I highly recommend checking out the Netflix documentary, Last Dance. That's what I had watched when I made these slides. Um, so yeah, so if we made um, each each planet, one of the basketball players on the 96 Chicago Bulls team. Um, and then instead of, you know, scaling them as we have here, we scaled each planet by its mass and each player by their, you know, influence on the team. Um, we could say that, you know, Michael Jordan was probably of the 72 games they won. He was responsible really for, you know, 52 of them, Scottie Pippen 16. So if we, um, Right, let's make this more accurate here. Let's, let's tilt uh, Dennis on his side. And uh, so, you know, if we scaled this correctly, it, it would look like this, right? Um, so we could break down, if we wanted to look at, say, each player's scoring, you know, we could break down each player's scoring by kind of, you know, how many points that they're good for on any given night. And then, you know, what, you know, if, another player was getting some rebounds and passing the ball to them, what, you know, what each player's effect on that player's scoring could be um, kind of the same as eccentricity evolution in the outer solar system, right? So, you know, Michael Jordan, if we look at him in 96, he scored 30 points a game. Um, we could say kind of his natural free eccentricity or free, free scoring is like 20, 27 points a game. Scotty Pippen's having a good game. He can bring that up by like nine points or bring it down by nine. Um, you know, the next most same as in the solar system, the next most significant, you know, perturbation on Jupiter is, is Uranus. And that's, you know, a factor of 10 less than uh, Saturn's. And you can do this for the same thing for, for each planet here. You know, Scotty's good for 16 points a game, but Michael Jordan having a good game, he can bring that up, or if he's, he's not passing the ball, he can bring that down. And if we did this, if we ran through this for each planet, you, you'll basically see that Jupiter will pop up. Michael Jordan pops up as like number one or number two um, in each planet's, you know, eccentricity expansion, basically, right? Yep. Uh, Steve Kerr's upside down. Okay. Um, so uh, why did I introduce that analogy? Um, so the as I said, the kind of consensus instability model is this uh, three to two, you know, Jupiter-Saturn resonance um, with the, you know, three or four extra ice giants. And the systematic problem with this, there's several. So first of all, 
because Jupiter and Saturn start so close to each other, these instabilities are inherently violent. Um, over half the time, you end up in that scattering regime. You know, you're plotting orbital period ratio here on the x-axis in the top. You're plotting that E55. It's very hard to match the magnitude of Jupiter's natural eccentricity, uh, E55, without you know going into that scattering regime. And then also, you know, the case if you look at um, the, the uh, Saturn's forcing term at E56, the cases where you sufficiently excite E55, E56 is also overly excited. Um, so to go back to this analogy, here's what the problem is here. Um, this is instead of, you know, instead of this, this is what these instability models are giving us. And this is why even if Jupiter's, you know, average eccentricity is matched in an instability model, um, we're still not doing a good enough job here because, you know, you're, you're predicting that, you know, Michael Jordan's only good for 14 points a game. He needs Scotty Pippen to, you know, bring his scoring all the way up, which um, if you remember anything from this talk, you know, Michael Jordan did not need help from Scottie Pippen to score a lot of points. You know, he needed help to score the championships, just like in the solar system, Jupiter does not need a lot of help from Saturn to maintain its moderately excited eccentricity. So, you know, in the kind of final phase of this talk, I'll give some results from um, work that we did over the last few years, looking at alternatives. Um, so it turns out capture in the three to two for Jupiter and Saturn is not the only option. Um, as more parameter space of, you know, different disk parameters has been probed, you can, can obviously have, you know, this capture in the three to two, um, but you can also get capture in the two to one. And when the planets are further apart in the two to one resonance, they can carve out their own independent gaps in the disk, and they can start to, you know, feel torques from the, the disk gaps and this can ex, um, excite their eccentricities. So in the, the three to two, you typically have low eccentricity evolution in the gas disk and the, the two to one, you can have higher eccentricities. Um, and this is kind of what we looked at. If you've had Jupiter and Saturn captured in the two to one opens up a whole bunch of different, you know, parameter space that you could probe. And that's what we did. Um, first thing we looked at was just, you know, four planets, so no additional primordial ice giant. Um, and if you do that, you uh, never retain all all four planets. So you need you need at least one more. We also looked at very high initial eccentricities, and once you get above an initial eccentricity of like 0 0.1, 0 0.3 for Jupiter and Saturn, yeah, they inevitably will scatter. Um, so that's no good too. Um, you also, that next planet, the ice giant that gets lost or what becomes Uranus, um, that has to be in a fairly compact uh, configuration with Saturn. So you're already in this wider configuration with Jupiter and Saturn in the two to one. So if you have that next planet in a three to two, we couldn't trigger an instability. The, the change just too dispersed. Um, so you need a compact resonance there. And then we just played with the different uh, parameter space to tighter chains, looser chains, an additional planet. And it turns out that the two to one works, works very well. This video is an example of it, but if we looked at those you know, main constraints that we talked about earlier uh, with the two to one, we have much higher uh, percent chance of retaining all four planets, uh, much higher chance of matching the eccentricities in particular, all four of those secular modes, which I'm gonna show here. Um, in a second, and a much higher chance of keeping Jupiter and Saturn from jumping too far apart. Um, so again, to, to prove to you that this is working, that we've kind of done a better job of solving the systematic problem, even though it, it is still very hard to get Jupiter's orbit exactly right, um, but we're, we're right in the ballpark here. Here, you're, you're basically plotting the partitioning um, of these, these four different important modes. Uh, so Jupiter on the top, Saturn on the bottom, um, the the Jupiter terms, the five terms on the x-axis, the six terms on the y-axis, uh, the red star is uh, the actual solar system values. And then that's all our simulation generated points and one of our best um, outcomes. And the reason for this basically, um, why we're able to kind of solve this problem is that uh, those cross terms start out as zero, right? As the, the planets, eccentricities excite in that mutual gap that they've carved out. You don't have those, you know, the E56, E65 terms to begin with. So, you know, when the instability excites the orbits, you excite those cross terms, you don't overly excite them. And, you know, I 
show of evolution here on the right where we match all of this. I know I'm kind of coming up against time here. Um, so I just wanted to make a few more points uh, before we open it up for questions. Um, you know, finally, I know this is Ice Giant seminar series. I know I, I'm, I'm getting to it. I'm getting to the Ice Giants, why, why they're important. Um, and that's what these final slides are here. So we like six planet configurations better than five planet configurations. It's very, very hard to match the Ice Giants orbit in the five planet case. Um, is in, Just in particular, it's just because, you know, you need several strong or one really, really big encounter to like adequately excite Jupiter's orbit correctly. So when we finish with four planets out of five, um, systematically, we, Jupiter is wrong, right? That's what the issue is there. But um, in the six planet case where you have two extra initial ice giants, we do a much better job of like, when you retain four planets, you're still able to match uh, Jupiter well. Um, the other point that I wanted to make um, within that six planet case, we do a better job of matching the ice giants orbits because they start further apart, do a better job of matching them um, when the uh, primordial Kuiper belt is less massive and the opposite is true in the five planet case. And then the uh, final point that I wanted to make on this that relates to the ice giants uh, before I get into what we're working on you know, now or tease what I'm working on now um, with regard to the ice giants is that um, again, to mat the, our, our bet, when we do the best job of matching Jupiter and Saturn's eccentricities, it's when those ejected ice giants, there are more of them and they are smaller. So we played around with different masses of that additional ice giant that we throw in there. And again, our most successful cases here on the bottom, um, I'm not gonna get into what all these metrics are. These are just percentages of systems that met our criteria. Um, the most successful ones are where you have a, you know, the six planet case with very, you know, less massive, um, in this case, six earth mass um, additional ice giants. So to me, this suggests that, you know, the one of our best models for, you know, explaining the obliquities of um, Uranus and Nep Neptune, and also, you know, the, the impact that we think tilted Uranus and, uh, you know, reconstituted its satellites into the current satellite system that is, uh, you know, orbits prograde with the, the rotation of the planet is that uh, Uranus and Neptune, you know, experienced some late giant impacts, which is what this uh, figure is showing here from a paper by Alice Chow a couple of years ago. Um, so to me, this hints that when the instability kicked off, the formation of Uranus and Neptune might not have been complete yet. And uh, in these final two slides, um, and then I will open it up for questions. Um, another reason why I think uh, this might be the case is that it is also, this is what we're looking at now, it is very, very challenging to retain the regular moons of really uh, both Jupiter and, and Uranus, but in particular uh, Uranus during the instability. Again, you have these strong gravitational encounters with Kuiper Belt objects and other giant planets during the instability, and this can strip moons or overly excite them. Um, this is from a 2014 paper looking at the effect of the instability on uh, uh, Jupiter's, on the Galilean moons. And the big problem here, which I'm highlighting in the red box, is um, it's very difficult to not overly excite the eccentricity of Callisto. Um, so only in a few percent of their cases were they able to get a good match. Now this, this might, you know, explain why there's no regular moons beyond Callisto, uh, but it's still, you need a particular correct evolution um, that has very few strong encounters to not, you know, strip or overly excite those moons. For Uranus, it's a totally different story. We've looked at um, the effects of all of our instability cases um, on Uranus as the paper is to be coming out soon. And um, really in the vast majority of our cases, 30% um, of the time, uh, ice giant will fly within the modern ob orbit of Oberon. Um, and the vast majority of the time, uh, a Kuiper belt object will, you know, a large Kuiper belt object, like a Pluto mass object will fly within the orbits of the regular moons or even hit uh, Uranus. And what happens is, you know, for the vast majority of these encounters, here we're plotting just a typical uh, series of ice giant encounters, the blue points, and the effect on the uh, five 
current regular moons of Uranus and you see and just, you know, we have one of these encounters that's just slightly too, too deep, too close of the ice giant flyby, you, you know, you lose three moons here and you radically overexcite the orbits of the other two. So um, what does this imply? Well, you know, it might, uh, it, it might imply that, you know, there's something we're missing. We need to kind of rethink uh, how the, the moons formed, maybe more of them formed, and then you know the instability stripped some, and they they recoalesced. Uh, but uh, what I I think this is kind of all getting at, just to put up my summary slide here, um, the the main points I've tried to make in this talk. So the first part I talked about big changes to the Nice model. We need extra additional primordial ice giants to get that jumping Jupiter evolution. We also think the instability happened in the first 100 million years after disk dispersal and possibly even the first few million years. So possibly coincident with the, again, the later stages of giant impacts that form the ice giants. Uh, the second part of the talk, I talked about the, the best you know instabilities in terms of their, their success rates for matching the uh, the outer planets orbits and you know we we kind of concluded that more less massive ice giants is better so again hints at the ice giants not being not needing to be in a fully formed you know state and then finally you know the if you have the regular satellites you know fully formed in their current configuration particularly at uranus uh, you inevitably you know destabilize them strip them during the instability. So I think to me, this is what we're working on now. I think this all, this is all telling us that the instability predated the final uh, assembly of Uranus and Neptune and also predated or either triggered um, the final giant impacts that tilted Uranus and Neptune and uh, possibly formed Uranus's moon. And sorry for going over, um, that is my last slide. All right, thank you so much, Matt, um, for your reactions, claps in the, uh, in the chat. Um, so let's get to it. Uh, if you would like to ask a question, feel free to type it into the chat and I can bring it up. Feel free to raise your hand um, and get to it. I've seen lots of Star Wars quotes. Uh, so, well, while you're all are thinking about the questions that you have, uh, I'll go ahead and start with a question. Um, so given these developments to the Nice model, um, how does it affect our understanding of the nature of the, the late heavy bombardment or other bombardment periods? Yeah, I kind of glossed over that, but that's all, you know, tied in with the moving the instability earlier stuff. Now our understanding of the late heavy bombardment from a geophysical standpoint has evolved as well. Um, so, you know, the original idea came out in the early 70s where really, you know, all of these basin basins that were sampled or we thought were sampled and dated um, by the Apollo missions all came back with dates of like almost exactly 3.9 billion years ago. Um, so now, you know, reanalyzing some of those same samples, um, also looking at updated uh, imagery from recent orbiters, updated gravity measurements, you know, our ability to kind of see cr craters that are on top of, or basins that are on top of older basins. Um, a lot of people have argued that, you know, there's, there's more of a smooth decline in cratering on the moon. So not necessarily a, a terminal, uh, spike. That's what one of those plots um, that I put up earlier is is trying to get at. So it's it's all wrapped up in this. Um, but you know, it, it you can still there's still many ways to have uh, a spike in cratering on the moon or on another solar system body at a, a specific point. So I think to me, it doesn't. You know, th these things don't have to be. Uh, necessarily tied in with one another. I think we have, you know, we're, we're at one point, the only thing that we had to pull a date to the instability was the late heavy bombardment. Um, now we have kind of multiple probes to get at when this happened. And I'm, I'm arguing um, in this talk that one other probe to maybe get at this might be 
uh, some of these aspects of the regular satellites in the outer solar system. Um, but, you know, other things that people have used are, you know, ancient families in the asteroid belt that would have been uh, disrupted um, by a later instability so that the instability couldn't have, you know, been occurred after the formation of those, those families, stuff like that. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, looks like we have lots of questions. Uh, we have one from Eleanor Service. Uh, for the evolution of the solar system, is all this work done by tweaking forward models and simulations, or is there anyone who works on this as an inverse problem? Can you sit, let me say that again. So done by tweaking forward models and simulations, or is there anyone that works at this edit inverse? Okay. Um, yeah, so it's well, it's from a dynamical standpoint, you know, the solar system's a chaotic system, right? So dy dynamically wise, we just we simply cannot, you know, integrate it backwards in time. And the you know, there's there's papers that go into this and get into more detail, but I, you know, that that number, you know, is in the you know millions to tens of millions of years where you know integration backwards in time gets you know, it gets inaccurate due to the in inherent chaos um, of the system. But again, you know, I, like I even hint at in this slide, slide when we're looking at um, things like when did the instability occur, like, yes, you can, you know, do the simple problem that we look at too, like you set up a bunch of these and you let them go and you see what the median time that things go unstable at is and what the dispersion and instability times are. But you can also, you know, push the thing backwards. And again, I, I go to that example of uh, collisional families in the asteroid belt where we're looking at, you know, Yarkovsky dispersion of the semi-major axes of different, you know, family members, collisional family members in the asteroid belt. And taking that backwards in time to seeing where that thing forms. So yeah, the, there's definitely, you know, certain constraints that are looked at, you know, in the inverse direction. But, uh, you know, as, as far as pushing play on the pure dynamical simulation, um, you know, at certain aspects of this, you know, certainly we like, we'll take a simulation, for example, you know, looking at how these things affect the regular satellites um, of Uranus take a good simulation. Okay, now, you know, let's go take those encounters, play with different phases of the moons, you know, run them forward, run them backwards. Um, but the whole problem, yeah, you kind of got to go start to finish um, dynamically wise. And then some of these constraints you can pull in um, in the inverse direction. All right, we have a question from Brian Palasuski. Uh, could you address the orbit possibilities of a planet X, which may be an ejected ice giant? Yeah, number one question that is asked when I give this talk, for sure. Um, yeah, it's the logical, the logical leap to make, especially because um, additional planets in the solar system has been a, a hot topic in the literature over the last five years or so. Um, yeah, as far as um, the ejected ice giant being out there today you know we've looked at this in our simulations other people that run these types of simulations have looked at that it can happen it is exceedingly rare like less than one in a thousand is what we've we've found um so typically when you have a you know an encounter between saturn and an ice giant or jupiter and an ice giant i think it's a one-way ticket out of the solar system now getting into the you know more uh the the more you know uh, untested stuff that i was alluding to in the end of the talk like the instability kicking off while you still had a bunch of ice giant embryos out there um that's not something that we have looked at um you know certainly is, is it possible that one of them could you know be kicked out sure um but it, from everything i've looked at i i think it's highly unlikely that there's an additional planet, you know, lurking out there that was a remnant of the instability. All right, we have a couple of hands raised too. I'm gonna to jump back and forth. Uh, Mark Hofstetter, go ahead and ask your question. All right, hi, good morning. Great talk, Matt, thank you. Um, I had a question about how, in, or my question is, how important is the location at which 
planetary embryos first form. And I'm thinking of some recent papers that suggest both terrestrial and giant planets formed, their, their embryos formed in relatively narrow annuli at like one and five AU, and then had to disperse from there. Well, from a, you know, from a like geochemical aspect, it's certainly something that we want to get at. It's certainly um, the, the, the holy grail to figure out where, um, where the cores of these planets accreted to kind of, you know, un, unpack the chemical, the compositional evolution of the solar system. Um, you know, for this, like, dynamically speaking, um, as I, as I alluded to, these, these cores can form, you know, all, all over the place. And, you know, depending on properties of the disk and its thermal profile and how it disperses with time, um, you can, you know, you can get inward, outward, two phase, all sorts of different crazy migration routes that we really, we cannot constrain, you know, these fundamental properties of the sun's disk. So we cannot rule them out. Um, so, you know, as far as this stuff goes, as, as long as all that moving around happens before this story kicks off, it doesn't really change anything. Um, you know, I think it's still a very, very open question. There's, you know, compositional arguments that you could make for Jupiter forming much further out. And there's also, you know, uh, degeneracies there where, you know, or, or mutual ex or exclusivities that, you know, people argue for Jupiter forming um, closer in or forming where it is. Um, so it, that's, it's certainly, it's certainly the holy grail to get at that um, from, you know, combined dynamical formation models and disk chemistry models. But as, as long as they get into this resonant chain one way or another, um, they, you know, it doesn't change the story too much. Now, you can't necessarily, Jupiter's got to get to somewhere close to where it is before the instability, because there's, there's kind of no way of, or at least we haven't found a way of like, having this instability kick off with Jupiter out at 10 AU or down at 1 AU and still them, the planets finding their way where they need to go. Um, so the kind of starting conditions, you know, where we put them is fairly close to where we think they had to be pre-instability, but that has, doesn't mean that they couldn't have moved all over the place uh, before. All right, thank you. All right, thank you. Unfortunately, we are at the top of the hour. Um, there's still so many questions, uh, but I'm just dropping in our community news slide and I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna snag the screen. Um, if you have more questions, uh, Matt, would you be willing to drop your email in the chat um, yeah, so certainly. people can reach out to you. I will do that right now. Wonderful. Um, so I'll just leave the community news slide up here. Uh, thank you everyone so much for joining. Next month we have Dr. Henrik Mellon from University of Leicester talking about uh, uh, giant planet atmospheres. Um, so everyone have a great week and take care. We'll see you next month. Thank you so much. <laughs>